Good morning, everyone, to another session of Foundation 101. And we continue this morning our mini series on uh, single family offices and how they can work together with Foundation. I'm joined this morning with a super senior associate, Celia Tituni. Celia, good morning. Good morning, Ian. And uh, yet again, we will look at another angle of uh, the use of foundation in practice. Today, uh, looking at where to set up a single family office. So let's, before diving into specifics and the option and how they can work and add benefits to, to people, remind people what is a single family office. A single family office, an SFO, is a private entity aimed at managing the investments and affairs of one single family. The assets under management are the family's own wealth, often accumulated over several generations. An SFO is restricted to provide services to members of one single family. I'm repeating it because that's an important point. That's the difference with the multi-family offices. Um, in addition to investment management, uh, an SFO would typically provide the following services. So succession planning, estate planning, tax planning, accounting and payroll activities, but also legal affairs management. Clear. So a single family office can provide a broad array of services and including, but not always, uh, to serve as a so corporate holding of a number of assets, be they operational like business or non-operational. Often it is mostly focusing on the non-operational, so the non-core uh, uh, investments. And at times it can hold them or not. Maybe a couple of words of wisdom from you on the value of consolidating the assets of one family under one or several holdings. So it has a lot of advantages. Um, some of them would include segregating the assets, so either by assets or by classes of assets, uh, shedding limited liability on those assets, but also uh, introducing an ease in financing or refinancing. And the last would be uh, from the top of my head to facilitate the transfer of ownership interests. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and we talked about this uh, uh, last week. There is a real process in, in setting up a family office. One need to think about the objective, about the rationale, what one wants to achieve. But what we did not talk uh, about is how is the current offering here in the UE in terms of where and how to set up a, a family office? So let's dive into this. Uh, what is the menu of uh, options here in the UE? So regionally, uh, three jurisdictions have created designated tools. Uh, those are the DIFC, ADGM, and the DMCC. All right. And that is on top of all the other options, because, of course, you can go through one of these three, which have bespoke proposition, but you could also imagine uh, operating a family office uh, out of UAE mainland, for example. A lot of local so, families currently do that. Uh, and mind you, are often in the process of restructuring it. Now, uh, so how can one choose between one of these three, and we're going to focus on these three this morning, uh, uh, between these three jurisdictions, what factors should one consider? So all three are sophisticated options, but we have to say that ADGM and DIFC are in a class of their own when it comes to sophistication and credibility. ADGM has historically had the most flexible regime. Uh, with no minimal share capital nor investable funds and no requirement for a physical office. It also has, as you can see, no publicly available information and you can set it up in as short as a week. In contrast, if one wishes to seek a DIFC SFO license, then the center would impose a minimum capital of $50,000 and a minimum liquid assets of $10 million with also the need potentially, I mean, historically for a physical office, save for exemptions where pre-existing substantial local presence can be demonstrated, or if you take the route of the prescribed scope companies, which I would come to in a second. It also has slightly higher compliance and reporting requirements uh, than its peer, and a number of data, including the name of the current and former shareholders, would be publicly available. 
setup time frame here would stretch to one to two months. So that's also something to take into account. Um, but both of the IFC and ADGM evolve, uh, give, give the option, sorry, to evolve within a regulated or supervised regime. And something important to note is that, as you know by now, there are both common law centers with independent courts. Just to come back on the IFC, so off late, uh, more flexibility has been introduced yes. with the launch of prescribed scope companies, as I was just saying. And there was also a subsequent reform, which really uh, gave additional flexibility. So what's a prescope, if you allow me? It's a light requirement and low cost structure designed for the conduct of passive activities, such as holding company, proprietary investment, or managing office. It can be established by a so-called qualifying applicant or for a qualifying purpose. These are um, expressions defined in the regulations. So as I was saying, the DIFC press call is exempted from being physically present in the DIFC, and that's an important point. So recently, as I said, with the reform, the enlargement of the definitions of qualifying purpose and qualifying applicant, large entrepreneurial families with operations and investments in the Gulf can now easily avail access to the sophisticated DIFC regulatory environment. One of the main uh, unique selling points for these two regimes is that they are compatible with foundations. And so uh, we have used them in a number of occasions uh, in conjunction with foundations to notably restructure local conglomerate with large UAE yes. presence. So here's your first nugget of information. If you want to set up uh, a single family office in ADGM and DIFC, forget what you have learned 10 years ago. It is actually extremely cost effective if you follow the Restricted scope company uh, route in ADGM or the DIFC Presco one. If you are a single family office already operating out of the DFC, good news, and it's the first time you hear it, you can actually decrease your running cost by changing the nature of your structure from bona fide single family office to prescribed company. Good news come your way this morning. Now, uh, you mentioned that DIFC and ADGM pretty much rule supreme because they are regulated center yet avail this a supervised uh, uh, route for families to take advantage of the ecosystem and, and, and the credibility when dealing with counterparties in each respective center. So what about uh, the MCC? How does uh, the generalist free zones uh, uh, single family office compares with those from these two financial free zones? The MCC also has a few advantages. So think, for example, in terms of offices. If one wants a physical office, then the MCC would have a lot of options at all um, prices range. But the MCC is somewhat, um, its offering is somewhat less flexible and arguably less credible. So a supervised SFO can be established with a lower capital requirement, uh, ranging somewhere between 50,000 dirhams and a minimum of $1 million of liquid assets must, must be shown on the account within a year after setup. This option also imposes higher compliance and reporting requirements. And in terms of privacy, it has the same amount of publicly available data as the IFC, comparably. Um, setup time frame is also um, comparable to the IFC. And something, uh, the, the last point I would add on this option that's important for whoever listening is that the DMCC is the only option outside of common law center. So that means that uh, they don't have their own course, so local course would be competent. That's something very important to take into account if you're trying to protect your assets or um, uh, plan, plan, plan your succession as well. So if I put that in perspective, uh, what I read is that two have been designed and built as a very sophisticated center for the financial industry and have this entry level offering uh, in a supervised, not very regulated way for family offices because they deal with their own money and not with uh, third party customer money. The other one is actually the most sophisticated tool within a generalist free zone. And it's interesting that 
on the one hand, you actually, uh, you do not bother the regulator too much because you, you, you are only restricted to, to something that is non-financial, whereas on the other side, you are deemed the most supervised of, uh, of the firm and many families are unaware uh, of this. And in both cases, you need to comply with AML regulations, have some sort of internal processes, but it's more natural to probably go towards that when, or to expect it when you are in a financial center as opposed to a generalist free zone yet. The opposite is true, so it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a good a good point. You mentioned all these advantages and key features. Uh, what where I want to to hear you at is whenever you set up a, a single family office, whether it acts or doubles as a as a, as a holding, uh, we often see these structures falling short one way or the other. What is in your mind the the, the, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit of of address of where these structures fall short? Um, I would say traditional SFOs and family holding consolidation structures in general often fail to address key concerns when it comes to legacy planning and asset mm -hmm. protection. Um, individual shareholders are still exposed to third parties attacks and the shares held in an individual capacity would remain subject to probate procedure in case of demise. And as you would expect, um, that's where foundation would add value to a corporate structure. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's to me, uh, very surprising that still today you have very sophisticated generation one, generation two family that think that because they have some sort of offshore entity or free zone entity that uh, they are not subject to probate in the UAE. It's fundamentally exactly. wrong. Uh, now, it's not a problem that it is wrong. The, the, what is important is to let them know and say, hey, there is a solution and that solution uh, is the foundation. So how can a uh, foundation mitigate that uh, risk where you will shift from individual shareholder to now a foundation? So just a quick refresh on what a foundation is and that will give you the answer. So foundation is an independent legal entity with a distinct personality separate from the founder. It's again compatible with all UAE asset classes, so real estate, shares, portfolios, and they enable the entrepreneur and his family to consolidate and keep control over income generating assets and investments while protecting them from potential threats. Once again, they're equally effective for Muslims and non-Muslims. They can be used in combination with corporate structures um, for example, um, holding shares of a holding or operational companies to guarantee business continuity and smooth intergenerational planning. All right. So if I gather all this and we put it in more visual term, let's take a group which has an operational entity, maybe a couple of uh, ancillary uh, corporate businesses uh, directly or indirectly run by a family and some real estate. What we often see today is that they are not consolidated and they are improperly uh, structured in some sort of legacy planning or asset protection vehicle. And the family on top of that is considering setting up its own organization to start to manage these assets. And this is the way it would typically look uh, if we were are to talk with clients, of course, considering their main objective, uh, you would have at the bottom line, uh, all the assets, we would tend to consolidate them under one or several holding vertical. As Celia mentioned, doing that is a huge step forward, but it is not the end because you would still have an individual or several as shareholder, which opens all these shareholding to risk. And we want to mitigate that risk. The way to do that is to top it up with one or sometimes several foundations. Uh, the entrepreneur can set it up by himself, be the first beneficiary, keep the control during his lifetime. So he controls the group the same way he would. Yet, as you can see it here, all these assets are protected from probate, from attacks. And what you see here on top is the single family office, so the organization that has been set up there with a specific objective, which is to manage uh, the family's own assets and to uh, provide for a number of ancillary services to be defined. Here in our scenario, it does not double as a holding. This is our preferred model uh, at MHQ. We like to have a holding vertical and the servicing entity on the side. The reason for that is 
eventually you may abandon this SFO or it may morph into a multi-family office, at which stage it would be impractical for the family to actually have mixed the holding vertical and the service uh, entity. This is why we do it this way, yet the single family offices shares in our example are held by a foundation just for um, illustration there is today about uh, 25 single family office in the DAFC either operate with a single family office license and about 16 DMCC 80 percent of these are held in individual name so clearly someone has not necessarily been listening or uh, should start to do now because clearly they may want to improve their structure uh, in the coming weeks and that's what we are here to advise so Celia, thanks a lot uh, for your input this morning. This was very clear. Uh, next week, we'll continue our mini journey over how single family office work in practice. And Ismail will be returning to talk to us about the do's and the don'ts when setting up a family office. Celia, many thanks and good day ahead. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.